Imagine you are born blind. You adapt to this condition and you become very good at navigating without size, at remembering where are places, objects, at localizing sounds, even at reading with your fingers. In some sense, you become with like this Marvel superhero, Daredevil. You compensate for the lack of vision by developing some kind of supernatural skills in your remaining senses. Then someone comes to you and tells you, I can fix your eyes, and he can provide you the gift of sight. A miraculous would that be? But is it? If we look at the very few cases in the literature of people who recovered sight after a lifelong experience of blindness, we see that what was expected to be miraculous can sometimes turn out to be a disaster. Take, for example, patient SB. He was investigated by the famous psychologist Richard Gregory. SB regained sight at age 52. And in his monograph about the case, Richard Gregory explained that his case is in some way tragic. He lived with one of the greatest handicap, but yes, it lived with enthusiasm and energy. And when his handicap was apparently swept away, as by miracle, he lost his peace and self-respect. Actually, a few years after recovering sight, SB committed suicide. In my research, I am trying to understand what may happen in the brain of blind individuals that could explain these somehow tragic case stories. I am a cognitive neuroscientist, so during my work, I am often contemplating this fascinating but very complex product of evolution that is the human brain. We try to understand how this brain implements the mind, how cognition and per perception emerge from brain activity. So, for example, what we know is that when you see something, it activates the back part of your brain, what we call the occipital cortex, and it does so in an organized fashion. You will have some region, that some, what we call some computational unit, that will prefer to respond to some specific input. For example, you will have some region that will prefer to respond to faces more than to any other object. Other region that will prefer to respond to places or scenes. Other region that will prefer to respond to inanimate objects, at least if you don't drink too much of it. And finally, other region that will prefer to respond to object in motion more than to any static object. And all these computational units will interact with each other to create a unified and coherent perception of your environment. How is this organization emerging? What we know is that there is a genetic master plan that is at least partly driving this organization. How do we know that? First, because this organization is, is some, somehow universal. It's highly similar between each of us. Second, you can find trace of this organization in very young babies. And finally, you can find this organization even in our evolutionary ancestors, like primates. All this together suggests that there is a genetic determination in the way this organization emerged. Does that mean that experience plays no role? For instance, what would happen if someone is born blind? Will this region remain silent and not participate in anything? If you actually test that in the laboratory, this is not what you observe. We observe a phenomenon that we call cross-modal plasticity. The fact that the region typically dedicated to process visual information massively reorganized to process auditory or tactile input. And what is quite fascinating with this reorganization is somehow that it follows a division of computational labor that is similar between blind and sighted subjects. You remember this region that I said was specific for visual motion in the sighted. Actually, this region remains selective for motion in blind people, but process motion in the auditory or tactile modality. So it seems that this region maintains its function, but applies this function to a non-visual modality. So these kind of discoveries are very important for us to understand how nature and nurture interact to shape brain development. On one side, we clearly see that experience plays a dramatic role. In case of visual deprivation, 
those regions massively reorganize and play, participate in another type of processing, the processing of another sensory modality. But at the same time, we see that there are intrinsic forces that constrain the way this reorganization expresses. So I've just said that in early blind people, the occipital cortex, normally visual, functionally participates in non-visual processing. What would happen if a blind subject recovers sight? All this newly reacquired visual input will interact or even interfere with these auditory or tactile input that are now rooted in the occipital cortex of this uh, blind subject. Actually, a few years ago, we had the unique opportunity to explore this question by investigating a, the case of a patient which was born with massive visual impairment up to the moment she recovered sight at age 47. And what we did is that we tested this person, or at least how the brain of this person react before and after sight recovery. And what we saw before sight recovery is that because she was highly visually impaired, her brain reaction, the reaction of her occipital cortex to visual input, was highly clumsy. But because she lived as a blind subject, she had massive activity in this region for auditory information, for example. After the reacquisition of sight, what we saw is that this region progressively became tuned to the visual input. But what was probably the most striking discovery is that even seven months after sight recovery, we could still find trace of auditory activity in this region. So it means that if you are born blind and live a life as a blind subject and get vision restored as an adult, you have an occipital cortex that simultaneously reacts to vision and to audition. And we believe that this interaction in the occipital cortex may potentially create some interference, can challenge the optimal reacquisition of sight. Actually, you do not need a full experience, a full life of blindness to experience those, those kind of reorganization. Even if the blindness is very short, but early in life, in the most sensitive period of blind development, like in the case of these babies born with dense bilateral cataract that got operated very early in life, few weeks or few months after birth. If you test them when they are adults, actually, even in these people, you can find trace of auditory activity in their occipital cortex. And again, this may potentially explain why these people never reacquire perfect vision, even in adulthood. So what I wanted to tell you today um, is that you can look at brain plasticity in two ways. There is obviously the adaptive side of plasticity. The fact that the brain can reorganize to um, interact with its environment, to potentialize its capacity. But there is also a maladaptive way of looking at the plasticity. The fact that reorganizations that are put in place early in life are very difficult to undo and potentially could interfere with the reacquisition of sensory information later in life. So I hope I've convinced you today that the study of brain plasticity is an important topic. It's also a very timely topic. Why? Because we are living exponential increase in the medicine of sensory restoration. So it's very important to tackle this question now. What we hope is that we can use neuroscience to predict who will be the good or the bad candidate for sensory restoration. And potentially also that we can leverage our knowledge about brain plasticity to design better tailored rehabilitation procedure. Thank you.